So one of the things that we are uh, interested in is, given that we have some kind of a setup with you know an iterative data flow graph and so on, we can compute something called the critical path that basically tells us what is the minimum time between successive iterations of the graph. There is also something else uh, called the iteration in uh, the initiation interval that we were able to find out, right? I mean, essentially, this is the sort of smallest average time unit that you can use in order to get to uh, uh, as close to the optimal uh, iteration period as possible. Now, one problem with that concept of iteration period bound and sort of saying that, you know, for a feed forward graph, for example, the iteration period bound is zero. And, you know, in principle, I can uh, make the average time per sample to be as small as possible. Or even if I have, you know, some kind of a feedback loop saying that, okay, I can actually achieve this iteration period bound. The problem with those statements is that it assumes that uh, you have infinite amounts of hardware. The assumptions on iteration period bound and so on are valid, assuming no limits on the amount of hardware that you have. But in practice, that's never the situation. In practice, you always have a finite amount of hardware. The given operations that you have need to be scheduled onto those finite uh, set of uh, hardware uh, units. And based on that, you will be able to actually compute the critical path as well as the iteration period, right? the time between samples. Now, the moment you have finite amounts of hardware, you need to start looking at, is this really the best way that I can make use of this hardware? But I have done something else in order to make better use of the available hardware, etc. Right? And there, one sort of very powerful way of looking at the whole problem is to think in terms of transformations. Right? Can I take the graph that I have been given and transform it in some ways? That is to say, I change it around, uh, modify it appropriately without changing functionality in such a way that some property such as the critical path is improved. So what we are going to do now is look at two of the most important such transformations. I'm saying two, but actually it is actually strictly speaking only one transformation. Uh, the sort of broad uh, thing that we should be looking at is this concept of retiming. Pipelining is a special case, but it is a sufficiently important special case and a sufficiently, you know, that, that it is useful to study it on its own, right? So what I'm going to do is to start by talking about pipelining. The basic concept of pipelining you are all already uh, surely familiar with. What we are going to be doing is looking at it in the context of uh, data flow graphs and hardware implementation. After we have looked at pipelining, we'll see how we can generalize that concept to iterative data flow graphs. Okay, so now uh, one other thing which I feel is useful in this context is so far, we have generally been talking about the nodes in a data flow graph and, you know, sort of thinking of them as some kind of operations, right? So because of the fact that we started out with a filter, right, it is natural to sort of think of the nodes in a data flow graph as perhaps representing multipliers, adders, and so on, right? Now, hopefully this, the way that I've written the code over here, makes it clear that a node in a data flow graph can be much more than an adder or a multiplier, right? So the program snippets, so to say, that I'm writing over here are broadly in something, you know, a language that is somewhat like C or C++, but, you know, is definitely not syntactically accurate or uh, even complete in any sense, right? So, for example, variable declarations are not there. I'm using some of these things in a way where clearly, you know, the intent is more important than whether the syntax of the uh, use is correct or not, right? So the example that I'm showing over here is you have this top. This is some function, right? I've written it as a void function because I don't really care what this particularly returns. The reason for that is I'm assuming explicitly that, you know, the in is some kind of a token that comes into the system and out is going to be generated as an output of the system, right? Now, this is not typically how C programs work. In general, in a C program, I would normally have had this as the output, right? But the reason why I'm doing it this way is because I could have a situation where I want to generate more than one output from a function. And unfortunately, C doesn't really allow me to do that properly, right? 
I'll have to sort of pack it into a struct or do something else of that sort if I want to do it. Instead, I'm just going to have all the parameters as part of the you know, parameter list of the function. Now, you know, from the point of view of Verilog, this is also a natural way of thinking about it, right? Because in Verilog, there are no sort of return values for modules. There are input ports and output ports, okay? So what I have written as in and out over here, right? Uh, don't think of these as very log modules. It's probably better to think of them actually as C program functions, right? The reason I'm saying that is because if you're thinking of it as a very log module, then there is a sort of implicit understanding that there is a clock associated with this and so on, which I really don't want or care about over here. I am looking at something where this function as well as these other functions A, B, and C are purely behavior in the sense that, you know, I only care about their functionality. I don't care about how many cycles they take as such when I'm writing them at least. Okay. Now, what this effectively means is that I can think of this top level function as itself representing some kind of a data flow graph, right? And what do I mean by the data flow graph? Effectively, what is happening over here is this variable in is going into the function A is coming out uh, and over there it has the name OA, right? Now, what is in? Is it an integer? Is it a floating point number? Is it an array? Is it a struct? Is it a class? I don't care, right? And that's precisely the point. As far as I'm concerned, it is a token. Okay, it is something that is consumed by A every time that it executes. And OA is some other type, possibly, that is produced by A every time that it executes. Now, what happens to OA that get consumed by B, which produces OB. And that in turn gets consumed by C, which produces OC. Okay. Which is basically what I have drawn over here, right? You can think of it this way by basically saying that A produces some output, which in turn is consumed by B. And that in turn produces an output, which is consumed by C. I will notice that the way that I have drawn the graph, I don't have this, you know, the out or the in over here. The reason is that as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm not really bothered about those uh, parts because they are not, they are not going to uh, affect my uh, analysis of the timing or the time required for executing this function in any way, right? So A to B, B to C, these are the dependencies. And you can see that clearly over here, right? This OA is used by B over here. Similarly, OB is used by C over here. In other words, until A has finished executing, B cannot start. Until B has finished executing, C cannot start and so on. Okay. And this idea that, you know, until A has finished executing, B cannot start and so on is important to keep in mind because I could Normally, the way that I would be looking at this is even though I have written it as a void top over here, the usual method of usage would be something like this. I have a for loop, right? It could be an infinite loop. I don't care whether it's an infinite loop or whether it is a finite number of times. And inside this, what I have is the top function, which I'm going to sort of expand out over here and basically say A, B, C, right? And what you can sort of think of is this effectively corresponds to an execution, which looks something like this. A has to happen. After that, B has to happen. After that, C has to happen. And then afterwards, the entire thing can repeat. And this one execution of ABC is considered one iteration. Okay. So a complete execution of A followed by B followed by C can be thought of as one iteration of this data flow graph. Okay. Now is C the one producing the output or is something being done by A or B the actual output of the system? I really don't care. So it's not really you know, even though I have written in this case that C consumes OB and produces out, I might also have a situation where I'm more interested in one of the intermediate values, OA or OB also. Okay, we'll get to that later. That is more important in the case of the sort of, uh, you know, the iterative graphs that we look at. Later. 
Okay, so this was just a very trivial kind of data flow graph and the corresponding, you know, what the execution could look like. Because of these dependencies A to B to C, what it means is that, again, sticking with the sort of software uh, understanding of this system, effectively what it's telling you is that even if I had, let's say, a dual core uh, processor, right, I can make use of only one core because only after A has completed execution, the function A has completed, can I start B and only after B has completed, can I start C and only after that, can I then start the next system, okay? Now, you will probably realize that, you know, I mean, there was nothing preventing me from starting two copies of A, but assuming that there is, you know, if I make a slightly different assumption that I have only one hardware unit that is capable of uh, running A, right? and another hardware unit that is capable of running B, another hardware unit that is capable of running C, then I'm actually, you know, forced to sort of uh, uh, wait until A has completed before I can then move on to B and then C and so on, okay? So on the other hand, what happens if I change my code slightly like this? Oh, so before we get to that, let's look at what happens uh, at, you know, uh, something that we can define or analyze from this graph and that is the critical path right so what we are saying over here is a produces some output that is used by b and then that in turn is used by c okay now the critical path over here is ta plus tb plus tc and what i am saying is in order for one iteration to complete a b and then c have to finish okay now it's important to keep one thing in mind over here right uh, because this will become a, it will uh, this will become a little bit more clear when we go to the next uh, modification of this function but i am sort of explicitly trying to bring out that i cannot for example have the next iteration of a starting until a and then b and then c have completed okay and why is this the case because i mean one way of thinking about it is to say that look at these variables that I have declared over here, right? There is this OA, OB that are being declared as intermediate variables, right? Effectively, what I'm saying over here is A is consuming an input, producing OA. It is going to use some amount of storage, right? Some uh, registers or something like that. Until I have then completed B, I cannot overwrite that value of OA that has been produced, right? That's the assumption that I'm making. In other words, I don't have any extra storage that is available for me, right? And similarly, until I have completed B and then start, uh, until I've completed C, I cannot sort of overwrite the value of OB. I need to keep those values around until everything is complete, right? So if you assume that we have a situation of that sort where I cannot really sort of, uh, start the next instance of A until I have completed B and then C, right? Then basically what we end up with is A to B to C is the critical path through the system. All three of them have to complete before I can start the next iteration of this graph. Now, what happens if uh, the assumptions that we have over here are, you know, that each actor or node in this graph has a fixed delay it could be a certain number of nanoseconds, it could be clock cycles, it could be, in, in general, some arbitrary time units. Right? And the data for graphs itself that we are talking about are homogeneous SDF, that is to say, uh, each edge basically consists of and corresponds to one token being produced on the edge and one token consumed on the edge by the destination node. Right? Every time that the destination executes, it will consume a node from each edge that is coming into it and on each of its outgoing edges it will produce one output token and in terms of uh, the meaning of time essentially what we are saying is that once a starts it takes a certain amount of time a fixed time ta to complete and only after that time can b start and during that time while b is executing the input of a is expected not to change so that assumption is sort of important. One way of thinking about it, you know, would be to 
course, in terms of functions, it's a little bit harder to understand why we would say, after all, you know, everything is stored in a variable. But supposing I had, let's say, the filter, right? Then I would have a structure which looks something like this. Effectively, what I'm talking about is until, you know, A, that is this multiplier first finishes, after that this adder, and then after that this adder, right? And this entire chain, A to B to C, has to complete, right? That is to say, the multiplier plus an adder plus another adder is the critical path, right? You could ask the question, after all, once the multiplier has completed and the data has gone into the adder B, why can't I put in a new set of values into the multiplier, right? But the assumption is that you can't do that because there is a possibility that there are sort of so-called short paths, which means that a change in A could quickly go and upset the value at B, even before it has been used by C. Okay, And we are assuming that such a situation is not permitted to happen. In other words, what we actually want is when we say that this is a combinational path through A to B to C, the combinational delay through A is only Tm. But I have to wait until Tm plus 2 times Ta before I can give a new set of values to the multiplier. What that also means in this case is that, you know, even in the case of, even, even if I'm thinking in terms of software functions, I need to think of it the same way. I have some kind of functionality such that only after A and then B and then C have all completed, can I give a new set of tokens or new inputs to A so that it can start proceeding. And yeah, so basically what we are saying in other words is when B starts, A cannot be given a new set of values because its output is still being used. 